What's going on, Mafia Nation? It's your boy DJ Scale. I'm Max. I'm LVT. And we're here today to do another music video review for you. Let's get it. Horrible. Let's get into this thing. Music so video excited. review. I'm so tired, but I'm so excited. All right, tonight we are checking out some Sabaton. This is No Bullets Fly, Charlie Brown and Franz Stiegler. I have no idea who Charlie Brown is because I think it's Sabaton peanuts. history. It's not just Sabaton, Sabaton. Sabaton history. history. Affirmative. Yes. yes. With Indy Lydell and Parr. I, Parr. I like Parr, but I, I, I really like Joaquin. He's funny as hell. He always cracks me up. He's so funny. We're, he's, the, he's the lead singer, the, you know, when they were in the desert, he was doing the interview with him. Yeah. He's like, uh, it's yeah. hot. <laughs> a, a cup of sand in the mouth. Yeah. yeah, he said he ate a whole cup of sand. He's like, yeah. uh, great, I ate a whole, whole cup of sand. But I was here. That does yeah. not sound yeah. fun. Yeah. And but uh, do you know anything about Charlie Brown or Franz Stiegler? I do not. I, uh, I feel like I've heard Me I've too. heard the story of Charlie Brown when I was in, in like high school from my history teacher, but I cannot remember how it went. What, could you give us any pointers? Nothing. 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 Cool. Go. We'll find out before we watch this video, though. Make sure you subscribe. Smash that bell button. And don't forget to like, comment, share, so everyone you know can do the same. Because on this joyous season, sharing is caring, and caring is sharing. See if you can catch a snowflake on your tongue. Man. I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Pat from Sabaton. And, and this, this is Sabaton, Sabaton History. History. His eyes are incredibly blue. Why are the subtitles in France? I'm Even just going to take them in off. in the depths of the inhumanity of World War II, you still find stories of humanity and even honor between the two sides. Yeah, and thanks to the American author Adam Marcos, we found out about the story about No Bullets Fly. And that's a story I'm going to tell you right now. Is that when they stop for Christmas? Song. It's hard to describe if you see an airplane that's so, so crippled. And for me, it would have been the same as shooting at a parachute. I just couldn't shoot. Oh man, this one's going to be a banger. December 20th, 1943. Days before Christmas, Christmas and thing. snowflakes spatter the windshield. What a perfect one for Christmas! Mm. American B-17. What are the odds of that? We didn't plan that at all, guys. That's Actually, awesome. this is just. I'm excited. Look at all these happy accidents, folks. Yeah. <laughs> and all of the snow. Beautiful. Snowflakes spatter the windshield of ye old pub, an American B-17 bomber flying 20,000 feet above the North Sea. It's part of an eight mile long bomber stream on its way to northern Germany. Their target, a Focke-Wulf aircraft factory in the city of Bremen. Piloting yeah, a flying like fortress as the B-17s are mm. home for the first time is Charlie Brown, who has the lives of 10 young men of the 379th Bombardment Group in his hands. They ready their 12 500 pound bombs. This month, the Americans will drop over 2.6 million pounds of bombs onto German industrial and military targets. Shortly after 11 a.m., they cross the German border, nervously on the lookout for enemy fighters. Because if they can see Germany, so too can the German spotters see them and calculate their height, speed, and intended destination. Covering them as escorts are P-47 Thunderbolts, whose job it is to intercept the enemy. At 11.30, puffs of black smoke appear all over. German 88 millimeter flat cannons are opening up, oh, sending 20 pound shells into the air. That's some Each serious has stuff, a man. timed fuse, so they explode at different altitudes. They explode. Like, that's some serious stuff. That blows holes in the sides of, of machinery, like huge holes, because it explodes five feet that way and just throws a piece through. Wow, mind blowing! Flak is is the craziest thing ever. That's actually where the, the term flak jacket comes from. Is because it was a wear. They used to wear jackets there. Each has so. a differently wow. timed fuse, so they explode at different altitudes. The explosions rock the pub, and Charlie can barely see a thing through the smoke. Suddenly, a red flash explodes right before his eyes. The plexiglass nose of the plane is sheared off and smashes against the windshield. Whoa. The men up front are unhurt. But ice cold winds now stream through the plane. The outside air temperature is minus 60 Celsius. The shelling continues. Another red flash and engine number two is dead. Another shell goes straight through the left wing before exploding further above. And on the right, engine number four is damaged and spins wildly out of control. Charlie fights the controls to keep it from ripping off the wing. But yet another shell rips through the roof. 
Charlie's main focus, though, is now on keeping the plane straight as the command to drop the bombs comes over through the radio. The pub gives a big kick as the heavy cargo falls on the smoking city down below. It's time to head home. The bomber formation turns back towards the North Sea. But the danger hasn't passed. They are still over enemy territory. Charlie's crew frantically scan the sky for enemy fighters, but the sky is empty of them. Not just the enemies, though, also their own. Oh, man. They were the last ones. Mm. I just got to say, that's got to be absolutely horrifying. You'd be like, oh, cool. There's no enemies. Where that's everybody else. I could yeah, say, well, time out. I was just going to say, time out and think about this, too. Those are also all of your friends. Your comrades. Dude, that's a, that's, that's a heart-wrenching thought process. Yeah. So absolutely. you literally look around at, you, at your crew members who are your closest friends, and you're like, man, we made it. That's, that's insane. Yeah. Now, none of the bombers have made the run unscathed, but the pub and the bomber beside them are seriously damaged. Charlie can see that the other plane is in bad shape, smoke pouring from two engines and dangerously losing height. The pub itself stays up, but is reduced to two functional engines, and both planes have fallen way behind as their formation has flown on ahead. Oh, okay, so they the live. The other plane dives to try and put out its fire. It disappears up. behind okay. some clouds, and suddenly a red flash catches Charlie's eyes. The other plane is gone. His co-pilot cries out. Dark gray shapes appear on the horizon. It's a squadron of Focke Wolf 190s closing fast. At the same time, a group of Messerschmitt 190s leap through the clouds below where the other B-17 has just disappeared. Charlie's men ready their machine guns as the two lead 190s aim for the pub's cockpit to take out the pilot and the controls in one attack. But Charlie turns and flies full speed toward the attackers, only presenting them the narrowest target while also shortening the distance between them. That catches the attackers off guard and their bullets miss the cockpit and bounce off the plane's roof. Charlie's top gunner returns fire and hits a 190. It banks off on fire. The second 190 is hit by the nose gunner while trying to avoid collision. The right. Flying Fortress still has some fight in it. Now yeah. the 109's close from behind. The tail gunner tries to spin his guns. And nothing happens. The gun is frozen. Oh. Literally frozen. The winds blowing through the plane have now frozen the oiled gun. The attackers close in. The tail gunner signals Charlie, and he jerks the plane into a steep dive. Bullets ricochet off the frame, penetrating the glass of the ball the turret beneath the plane and cutting off half of the rudder. The radio operator calls out for help, but gets only static. Bullets have pierced the radio. Oh my 20 God. millimeter shells have punched through the plane and severely wounded many crew members. The tail gunner is now dead, and all of them are affected by the frost. Charlie fights just to keep the ruin of his plane in the air. Only one gun is still operable. Another attack and the cockpit is hit, puncturing Charlie's oxygen tank. Tipping to the left, the bomber spirals out of control. Faster and faster, it spirals downwards. Gasping for air, Charlie tries to get control, but the loss of the rudder makes that virtually impossible. Upside down, Charlie's vision fades. an intense story here man. Yeah. right he was he was a As beast before he went down towards the city of oldenburg charlie comes to the lower altitude especially because he's in a bomber oxygen. that had to not be easy to turn in general the controls, fighting right. the plane with all of his strength at just three thousand feet under a thousand meters he pulls it out of its dive right above the houses of oldenburg the plane is even close enough to sheer shingles off the roofs Ooh. charlie manages to pull the plane back up at least what's left of it. Most of the crew is wounded or unconscious, only able now to fly 135 miles per hour, 217 kilometers per hour. To escape back to England, they will have to break through the German lines per hour. To escape back to England, they will have to break through the German lines again. The dreaded Atlantic Wall, Germany's fortified coastline with the best anti-aircraft gunners in the world. Charlie makes clear that anyone can choose to bail out. Being a POW is still better than being shot to pieces, but his men refuse. Eyes fixed to the north, 
they fly past the Yever airfield, where German fighter ace Franz Stiegler is about to start his engine. Just a day earlier, he brought down a B-17, and shooting down another one makes him eligible for the Knight's Cross. Hmm. To Franz, though, this medal means more than just an award for being a killing machine. It means that there is sense behind his fighting, and that he has done his duty for his countrymen. He has seen firsthand what the bombers have done to cities like Hamburg and Bremen, reducing them to rubble. But his fight is not about hatred or revenge. It's about duty and survival. Duty Franz Stiegler learned his craft during his service in the Libyan desert, where he flew with the Knights of the Desert and their star flight race Hans Joachim Marseille. He has lost a brother to the war. He has seen the destruction of the Africa Corps and then was caught up in the desperate fight for Sicily under Adolf Galland. He would earn his Knight's Cross by shooting down the flying fortress that appears now before him. He begins his attack run. But with his finger on the trigger and the enemy rear in sight, he does not shoot. Something stops him, a feeling that something is not right. The lack of fire from the other plane makes him curious, and it is then he spots the damage the enemy plane has taken. He flies closer and pulls up alongside. Stunned by the condition of the plane and how it is still able to even fly, the only gun not to... Okay, so this doesn't seem to be about the Christmas story, but it was more of he just seen how wrecked this thing is, and he says, I mean, You're still flying this? Regardless of how you want to see it, that's definitely a Christmas miracle. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not. Like, this cat's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how that's still flying. Yeah. You've got to be ghosts. <laughs> ...by the condition of the plane and how it is still able to even fly. The only gun not destroyed is the ball turret below, but it cannot elevate its guns high enough to harm Stiegler. I saw the tail gunner wasn't there because the guns were hanging down. Half the tail was missing on the, on the left hand side, but no tail at all. Franz knows that a few shots are enough to bring this contraption down, but there is little glory to him in shooting down a bunch of helpless men, even though their bombs have quite likely just killed his countrymen. He draws up right by the pub's cockpit. Now, Charlie's eyes are still fixed on the horizon, thinking of the flat guns of the Atlantic Wall. When suddenly a Messerschmitt appears right next to him, imagine how that felt. I look out the right window, and there parked on my right wing is a German BF-109. And so I sort of closed my eyes and shook my head as you would with a nightmare. And if I close my eyes and open them again, he'll be gone. Well, I opened them again, and he was still there. Well, Franz <laughs> waves at Charlie and points down, signaling that they should land, knowing that they stand no chance against the Atlantic Wall. Charlie shakes his head, and Franz knows that they are dead men unless he helps them. It's a Christmas miracle! Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely, man. So he stays with them as they fly towards the Atlantic Wall. See, the experienced German spotters on the ground will easily recognize one of their own. So as they fly across the AA guns, not a single one opens fire. Wow. Franz will wonder his whole life what the spotters think of that scene in the sky that day. As they pass unscathed, Charlie does not understand nor see what Franz has done to help him until Franz Stiegler salutes, then banks away. And only as he salutes does Charlie understand. The pub makes it back to England, barely. And it is a small miracle that it manages a landing. The commanding officer is about to award them medals for their service this day, but High Command gets wind of the story, how a German fighter pilot saved their lives, and High Command is furious. No one can know that the mission never happened. Everything is swept under the rug. Charlie and his crew are outraged, but that is that. Franz lands safely near Bremen, but he as well can tell no one what he has just done. This could get him court-martialed. Well, it could get him killed. If someone had seen him and reported him, it could have been a death sentence, a double. So he had the double impact. Well, the story may have just disappeared into the mists of time. But according to the book A Higher Call, in 1985, Boeing invited old fighter pilots to the 50th anniversary of the B-17. His first flights were back in 1935. Franz Stiegler was by then living in Vancouver, Canada. He was in attendance as 
pretty much the only German pilot and was interviewed by a local TV station and he told his story. Charlie, the same year, wrote to that old German flying ace Adolf Galland and the German magazine Jagerblatt trying to find out who his German savior was. It took until 1990 until they truly oh. found each other and met in person after letters and phone calls. Wow. Their startling story got worldwide attention. But you know, even after that, that's Even insane. so long after the war, France would receive calls from Germany calling him a traitor, <laughs> while some Canadian neighbors shunned him as a Nazi. France always responded, they would never understand. Absolutely not. That's an France, intense. What were your feelings when you met again for the well, first time? I was so happy as we met that I dropped him on top of him. What's the DT? It was like meeting a family member, a brother that you haven't seen for 40 years. That's about as close as I can come. So how did you hear this story in the first place? As usual, we are looking on the internet for ideas all the time. And I stumble about a very beautiful picture, which is a, a painting of two airplanes. And the picture is the front <laughs> cover artwork of a book a written by I an American it. author called Adamakos from Valor Studios. Right. When, when I saw this picture, I was like, what's the story behind it? And then starting to read and it was like, wow, this is a great story. And this is something we can do a song about. When we released the song, it was really interesting that I was contacted by a woman called Juvita Stiegler. Stiegler. Mm. Okay. And this is obviously the daughter of Franz Stiegler. Franz Stiegler. She wrote to me saying that her son, who's a fan of Sabaton, just <laughs> found out that he wrote a song about his, his grandfather. grandfather. That's awesome. Uh, awesome. We had just announced a tour where we were traveling in uh, North America. And uh, her family was based in Vancouver in Canada. Okay. And as we arrived there, we met with them. That's, That's really awesome, awesome though. So cool. it's, it's, uh, I, I love the, the little bits of these stories, like when you met Audie Murphy's family, you know, when you meet the descendants and stuff. I like that. It, it's when our songs become so personal and uh, when we get emotional about them because we also know that what we are doing is the right thing to do. Right. The song No Bullets Fly is from the album Heroes. Right. And here we are referring to Franz Stiegler because he had the opportunity to shoot down an enemy. But he didn't because, yeah. And that is heroism. You don't, you don't yeah, leave your medals. Because just, a hero, yeah. That is, he made that the, is the He made a choice to save a life, multiple lives. Yeah, it's like you said, there is no honor in bringing down right, well, a plane like that. Gentlemen, that's No Bullets Fly. And this is Sabaton history. And it's crazy because, like, you know, we always think of... Uh... All right, everybody. I'll Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the Sabaton History channel. Check out World War II, Time Ghost. And don't forget to support the Patreon because that's really what makes this happen. So killer. Yeah, that was awesome. But yeah, like... He chose honor and like uh, it's a common misconception that all Germans during that time were Nazis. They were not. It was a lot of uh, misinformation and propaganda and they were led to believe that the world was against them when really they were like their their top of their government was going against other people and just making them out to be the victim when they're really not they weren't at the time. So a lot of them were just people who were just trying to defend the honor of their country and their people. So like a lot of them did have honor and in this case he definitely showed the honor that he had when he i could take this guy out with a couple shots not even trying but right. instead yeah. let him let him live right and it's like phenomenal. i could do this with my eyes closed but that's another human yeah and, and he's already struggling yeah and, and the honor of fighting was you know to go up against an enemy who was able to defend themselves and fight for their rights and this person was obviously not going to fight anymore and he wasn't going to kill a person who was essentially unarmed right yeah. It's kicking somebody while they're down. Shooting he, somebody in the back as they're yeah. walking away, man. Yep. Yeah. And trying he, to limp away, barely. Chose to be an honorable human, and it was a beautiful story because of it. Yeah, and it irritates me that his neighbor, like, I can understand the Germans calling him and be like, you're a traitor. Okay, whatever. You know, he essentially he was a traitor with that for that. But his neighbors, like, calling him a Nazi and stuff and treating him badly because of that, like, did you miss the whole essence of this? The story came out because the man admitted that he was indeed fighting for the Germans, but chose to let another human being live. Like, 
that should prove exactly the opposite of what people think about Nazis. Right. And yeah. the the fact of the matter that if the shoe was on the other foot. Yeah. You know. Like, um, did you ever see the movie with uh, with Brad Pitt where he was like the Nazi killer guy? And sh- or was it Brad Pitt? Uh, yeah. And Glorious Bastards. Yes. Like, if you ever watch that, like, it's a funny movie. But, like, there's a part where they show the seriousness of it where, like, there was regular German soldiers. And then there was those that were loyal to the Nazis. And they would actually, like watch the regular soldiers and you know police the regular soldiers and make sure that they weren't realizing the truth of what was going on yeah i've never seen the movie but i mean like i said it's it's more of for humor sakes but that's one of the things that they had was right they, they showed the guy like how even the soldiers when this guy walked in got uncomfortable because like realistically back then you had the regular foot soldiers and then you had the guys who were straight up seek hail and the made SF. sure that everybody else stayed in line Mm-hmm. Yeah. like they were they were the ones that the regular soldiers were afraid of the ones who didn't really know like all they know is wow this the whole world's attacking us we don't know why yeah the words you're looking for is the ss and the gestapo that's that's it <laughs> yes ss and the gestapo yeah all in all great story um uh, if you guys have any other recommendations for us let us know in the comments below check out our discord or if you want to bump to the top of the list make sure you check out the donation link in the description below what else we got for them guys we also have our merch store with all of our new merch on there. And we also have some more new merch for you guys coming in the early, you know, 2021 as we're ending out this super shit-tastic 2020 year. Word soup hats. Yay. Yay. <laughs> all videos are brought to you by Word Soup, especially when it's four in the morning and we're super tired. Super shaky. Get it? Super shaky. I see what you did there. You've too gone too far. Too much. Sorry. Uh, you can also check out any of our social medias we had scrolling below. Get to know us as a people. As a band. As, as a, a band. As a, get to know us as a people. As a species. I am not a people. Well, according to you, we're aliens, so. Well, yeah. I am not an alien. But yeah, lots of fun stuff on there. But thank you guys again for watching. Till next time.